Uh, <clears throat> my name is Hannes. I'm here to talk to you about web development in China. I'm doing web development since 2004, so around IE6 times, if anyone remembers this. And I always did that being in Hamburg, but I got bored of being in Hamburg and in Germany. So in 2011, I ended up in China as a web developer. And that was not completely my expression, but it was a little bit my expression. So it's a screaming Lego person there. Um, because I felt like going back into the past a little bit. Because in 2011, when I arrived in China, I had to deal with supporting IE6 again. This is a world map of usage of IE6 in 2011. And you see this red spot there. I zoom this in a little bit. This is China with like over 30%. So I was like already used to not supporting IE6 anymore. And then I was right back supporting IE6. So that was not so great. So in the last seven years, all of this changed. By now, everyone is using a mobile phone pretty much all the time. And maybe like you feel more comfortable booking a flight ticket on a desktop computer or a laptop, that's what I do. In China, everyone does pretty much everything besides work, maybe. Um, the majority does everything on the mobile phone. So there's highly mobile optimized. Um, how does this happen that people actually skipped computers? So it's so-called a leapfrog effect. So people always had, like the majority of people always had um, cell phones. And the whole generation of people basically skipped from having a cell phone over the desktop to like having a computer in their hand, having a smartphone. So a lot of people, the majority of people actually never had a desktop at home, they just have the smartphone. This is why most people always use a smartphone by now. Um, before I go into my talk, I want to give you an overview of what I'm going to talk about. I talk about three topics. I call this the mandatory part. I talk about um, if you do projects for people within China, for users within China, what you need to take care of. I talk about the important part, WeChat. It's the number one social media app in China. And I talk about the development ecosystem, the community part in China. I think this is the most interesting part. Um, before I actually talk about these topics, I would like to know here in the audience who of you have been to China. OK, not too many people, actually. So for the people who have not been to China, no worries. I'm going to pick you up there. So you've heard that stuff is blocked in China, right? Facebook, Twitter, Google stuff is blocked. But you don't know what that actually means, because usually you come to a new country, you get out of the plane, you flip out your phone, you ask Google how to get to your hotel. Well, if you do that in China, this is how it looks like. So you still get the familiar blue spot, but you don't get anything else, and Google will not talk to you. So, and even though you thought you'd be prepared, you might figure out, OK, maybe not that prepared anymore. Other people come to. China a little bit more prepared, like Mark Zuckerberg. He runs over Tiananmen Square in Beijing and still kind of somehow is able to post it on Facebook so other people come to China a bit better prepared. And now that you have an idea of how it feels to be like a tourist in China, I would like to talk about the first topic, the projects in China or the projects for people in China or for users in China. So if your client tells you, hey, what can we do so that people in China can use our web page well, first of all, you might add translations to it, right? So you have maybe web fonts on that page. And I had a client, and they said, well, we have all these print products here, and we have a special font for Chinese characters, standing in the way here, um, having a font for special Chinese characters that we use for printing products. Maybe we can like transform that file, and you can use it on the internet. And I said, yes, sure, that's a great idea. Send it over. And I sent over a file, and it was 50 megabyte. And I was like, Maybe not a good idea, because Chinese has a lot of characters, obviously. And um, so they said, put it in any way. And I was like, eh, maybe not. So the idea here is just use system fonts if you use Chinese on your web page. If you want to use a web font, make sure that it's really highly optimized. Another thing that people like to do is having maps on their page to show fancy things. And usually, they use Google Maps to integrate that, and you have like, this is our company, and we have branches all over the world. This is how it looks. In China, it looks like this, so you don't see anything, right? So if you want to make sure that you have a map and the Chinese users, the Chinese audience, also can see it, you might want to use alternatives to Google Maps. For example, Mapbox still works. Uh, anyone from Mapbox in here? Nope. Um, OK. And um, maybe the better alternative is using a Chinese provider. In this case, it's Baidu Maps. This works reliable within China. Um, you just have to battle the Chinese translation, but I'm sure you can copy and paste code. It's going to work. 
Um, payment. Maybe you pay stuff. Uh, sorry, you sell stuff on your web page, and you wonder why is none of the Chinese users now that we translated everything is buying stuff on my page? Well, that's because you offer all these Western payment um, kind of ways that are not popular in China pretty much at all. Nobody's using these. Maybe some, but obviously not the majority. So, what do they use? Well, in the real life, you find these signs in restaurants and shops online everywhere. You find these three payment methods here. So if you want to make sure that people from China are not hesitant to buy stuff on your page, you want to integrate at, one, at least one of these payment methods on your page. Um, it's not that bad if you already use a, uh, a payment integration service like Stripe or Wirecard. They usually already offer at least one of these payment methods that you can then easily integrate. In general, there's something... Oh, okay, in general, it's always like a good idea to host stuff yourself. If you use CDNs, content delivery networks, or web font providers, make sure these are not blocked in China. And also make sure that these make that show on a regular basis, because you will never know when stuff is changing. So maybe the better idea is just to host stuff in general on your own server. Um, and then you think, like, how can we improve performance now that we have done all this? Well, you can host in China, right? It's going to be faster to load for the Chinese users. Mm. Well, in China, hosting is a little bit different. Uh, maybe you have seen a Chinese web page. They have these small numbers down here. And I zoom this in a little bit. It says ICP. Maybe you cannot read it so good. It says ICP, and there's a number. ICP stands for Internet Content Provider. And it's basically somehow the number plate of your web page. So it, it indicates who's responsible for the content of your web page. And um, yes, if there's any issue, for example, uh, that happened to other people that I know, uh, you have a country selector, and you list all the countries in the world, including Hong Kong and Taiwan. Someone's going to call you and say, please change that, um, otherwise we're going to block your page. Um, how to get this internet content providing number? Well, you need a company in China. So you need an entity of a company in China or a corporation partner or someone that helps you with applying to this, doing this process of applying for an ICP number. And once you have done that, it takes a longer time, maybe up to six, eight weeks, then you can legally host in China. And that was my first topic already. It was to talk about don't use web fonts for Chinese, unlike the, unless they're really optimized. Don't use Google Maps. Offer Chinese payment methods. Host stuff yourself. And if you want to host in China, get a license for that. Um, next topic I want to talk about is WeChat. Um, maybe you've heard of WeChat. Maybe people told you it's like the WhatsApp of China. And yes, maybe that was the case some years ago, but by now, that pretty much changed. Um, so in the Western world, we use all these different apps here to do all kinds of things on our mobile devices. By now, you could say uh, the majority of these things, or all these things, can be done in China by only using WeChat. Um, WeChat is created by a company called Tencent, and it's pretty much integrated into Chinese society by now. Um, how it is integrated into your daily life, I would like to show that in some <laughs> real-life examples here. Um, here, there's a QR code in a restaurant. I open WeChat, I scan the QR code, and I can order food, and I can pay, and it gets delivered to my table. Um, I ordered coffee here with WeChat. Uh, here, these are like QR codes that you see everywhere in restaurants that you use for scanning and payment. This is me exactly doing this. Um, scanning one of these QR codes and then paying with WeChat. You can also use that for street vendors selling fruits or other things on the street. They're going to show you a QR code and you can pay with WeChat. Basically, um, most of the Chinese people, um, or maybe just, yeah, yeah, uh, most of Chinese people, they don't take cash anymore. They just need their phone and you go out and you can do everything with your phone. You can also rent bikes with it. Uh, maybe you've seen these bikes also in Berlin, um, and you know that you have, uh, they already have their, their own native apps to rent a bike here, right? But these are also, these uh, functionalities are also integrated into WeChat. So once you have WeChat and you can rent all these bikes, you don't need the native app anymore. Uh, you can also do hospital appointments with WeChat. And the last thing that I figured out, apparently you can get a divorce with WeChat. <laughs> So, yeah, you can do a lot of things with WeChat. Um, and, um, yeah, 
To give you an idea of how this looks inside of WeChat, apart from the chat application, I want to introduce you to the wallet and how it looks like. Um, for example, here you have a mobile top-up thingy. If you run out of data on your phone, you can just top up your data plan there. There is something called utilities. If you click that, you get an overview. It's Chinese here, but it's an overview of your utility bills, like electricity, water, etc. You can pay all this with WeChat. And there's another thing. It's like uh, third-party operators. These are being, um, this is the default that comes with WeChat. You can buy rail and flight tickets, order a cab, get movie tickets, buy food, etc., etc. And usually all these services um, have their own native apps, but once you can use this, why would you install the native app, right? So when we talk about mobile first, I talked to some Chinese development friends and they said, well, in, we in WeChat, <laughs> in China, uh, you could talk about WeChat first because you need to make sure that your stuff is not working on a Safari browser, you have to make sure that your stuff is working inside of WeChat. And you can also extend that functionality. And before this was done by creating HTML5 pages that will be opened in the internal browser of WeChat and you can use an SDK and do payment and do the QR code scanning and stuff. But uh, I think, I don't know, one and a half years or one year ago, they created something called uh, Tencent created something called WeChat mini programs. And WeChat mini programs uh, are basically a better extension of, of uh, a better way to extend WeChat and write your own stuff for WeChat. And I give you an example here. The example is the Chinese Yelp, it's called Dianping, and this is the chat overview of WeChat. And I'm asking someone uh, for a recommendation for a Beijing duck restaurant in Beijing. And this person replies me with a link and I get a preview of this and usually you would expect I click this and the internal browser opens and shows me the detailed information of the restaurant. In this case, it doesn't do that because it says here on the bottom, you cannot see that it says here, it says mini program. So if I click this, not the internal browser opens, but a loading layer opens for like a second and then I get the information of the Beijing duck restaurant. It's a good duck restaurant. Um, and once you've done that, and you install these mini program into WeChat, you can also place that here on the right on your home screen. And if you click it here, you get the full functionality of the Chinese Yelp, Dianping, in this mini program that is opened in a WeChat layer. And yes, Dianping has its own third-party app, but as I said, once you can do the majority of things with just a mini program, why would you install the native app? Um, or why would you go to the mobile site? Because you're using WeChat all the time anyway. Um, and you might say now, this reminds me of a PWA. Um, and yes, you're right, because you can use it offline, you can add it to your home screen, and it's really highly performance optimized, it loads very fast. But in this case, it's a little bit special. So I call it progressive WeChat apps, <laughs> um, by exchanging the W. Uh, and it's a little bit special here, um, because these things are not hosted on your own servers, these mini programs are hosted on the Tencent server, the, the company behind WeChat, and they have servers all over the world, so it's going to be delivered and open very fast in WeChat. Um, there's a size limit, initial size limit of one megabyte, so it loads very, very fast. There are some other restrictions, but I don't want to mention all of these now. And the most important thing, I guess, it's not 100% web technology, it's a combination of, the, of a web view and native components from WeChat, like payment, QR code scanning, and some other stuff. Um, yeah, Tencent, how do you create such a mini program? Tencent decided to create their own JavaScript framework, and why not, right? Why wouldn't you do that? It's called Relang, and I said, come in, we are closed, because it's not open source, it's actually closed source. Um, yes, it uses something called WXML, WXSS in JavaScript, it's pretty much HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. They just um, called it differently. And as I said, it compiles into a native code, a mix of native code and the web view. They also created their own editor. This is the preview. This is how you write code. This is the debugging. Looks like the Chrome DevTools, right? Yes, it's a modified version of the Chrome DevTools, um, I would say at least. Um, this is the code for Hello World. It's not big enough, so I'm going to show you uh, two slides of code only, so you know how this Wheelang looks like, um, so you're not afraid of maybe using it. 
So this is the WXML, pretty much just the HTML template. Maybe people say it looks familiar, looks a bit like uh, looks a bit like Vue.js. And this is the CSS. And this is the JavaScript part. Uh, there's just a data property, and I add the hello world, and that's it. And after you, you load the initial kind of JavaScript, you can do some other functionality, like get user information and stuff and stuff. So you see it's not like that different. They also have their own bootstrap. This is pretty much um, the bootstrap of WeChat. They provide some uh, UX elements that you can use to style it in a way that it looks like WeChat. Um, Yes, that was the WeChat part. What did I talk about? I talked about WeChat, the number one social media app in China. There are other apps, but this is the most important at the moment, at least. I introduced the WeChat wallet and WeChat payment, and I introduced you the progressive web apps of WeChat, the mini programs. And this brings me to my last part. How much time do I have left? Like 10 minutes? Do I have 10 minutes? I have two minutes left? Wow. OK, this is the ecosystem part. Four minutes left. OK, cool. This is uh, the interesting part, the ecosystem, the community of China. Um, when I came to China in 2011, I was used to like go to conferences, go to meetups, and exchanging knowledge. I had the feeling that was not the case in 2011. I was, there was not a lot of conferences, not a lot of meetups, and people stick to, your own, stick to their own knowledge, or stuck to their own knowledge to like keep their place safe, in a way. By now, this all changed. Um, they have their own conferences, JavaScript, Vue, CSS, React, etc. They have a lot of meetups in the bigger cities, and they exchange knowledge way more than before. Um, they also created their own platforms. Because when we use Stack Overflow, we use English, we feel comfortable using English more or less. But for the majority, there's obviously a lot of Chinese developers, they are fluent in English. But for the majorities of Chinese developers, I would say, they don't feel comfortable using English all the time. So they can still use this, so like search stuff and copy and paste code as we all do. But once you ask a question here in not so okay English, you can imagine how it works out. And um, so they created their own Stack Overflow. It's called Segment Fault. It's green, it's green, and it's in Chinese. And it's easier to use, right, if you're Chinese. Um, no, but this is not the biggest platform. It's just uh, I wanted to show this because of the name and the similarities. What they actually use is not Quora, but the Quora of China, which is Zhihu. Um, here, it's called Zhihu. And this is used to exchange knowledge. This is actually the profile of Evan Yu, the creator of Vue.js, because he's Chinese and he has accounts on all the platforms, not only Western ones, but also the Chinese ones. And yes, they also created their own open source. You have like big companies in China creating a lot of open source. And now all these open source, usually in, in the Western world, is being done in English. So you have documentation, issue handling, communication is being done in English. But, if you're, uh, but the Chinese open source is completely done in Chinese. And they have to cater for a specific requirement. So they have to be highly mobile focused. They really need to scale, because if your startup becomes successful overnight in Germany, you maybe add a half million users. If your startup becomes successful in China, you can easily add 50 million users overnight. So stuff needs to scale. So and this is not only interesting for developers in China, but also for developers outside of China, right? So they want to use this as well. But now we notice that not only Chinese have an issue with being comfortable in English, but there's obviously an issue of us feeling comfortable in Chinese. And in these uh, open source projects, these issues appear. Can we have English, please? Or documentation and readme should be in English because, because, because. Or even better, and this is not a native language speaker, a, la a native English speaker, so this is why he doesn't understand what that actually means, maybe, but he says, guys, please use English. And I zoom this in a little bit uh, because there's a funny answer to this. This answer says, I think it's the best time to start learning Mandarin. <laughs> and yes, maybe it is. Maybe that's the solution. We all learn Mandarin till we figure out, fuck, this is hard. <laughs> maybe not the best option to do that. So um, what can we do? Well, Evan Yu, I quote him here. You don't need to read all this, figure that out. Um, Evan Yu says the project, one of the projects I just showed, it says, it lacks in terms of documentation and learning resources for English speakers. We intend to bridge this gap next year. And I think this is so important to actually bridge that gap, not only Chinese English, but like into all the directions. How do we do this? Well, we create, and this is, one, uh, this is another Chinese open source project, we create a dedicated task document translation, looking for volunteers who can help out. 
And I think this is so important that we do this because it doesn't only make it easier for people from not speaking Chinese to use your project or from people all over the world, developers all over the world use your project, but I think these kind of tasks are also a great way with a low entrance barrier to participate in open source because maybe you don't feel too comfortable of like writing great JavaScript, but you speak two languages and this is your first step into open source. You just can start helping to translate stuff and then maybe slowly getting into more of that. So I think this is a great thing. And Vue is doing this really great. And Vue is very popular in China. That maybe is because the creator is actually Chinese. But also, I think Vue in general is doing a great job on documentation and translations. And um, I actually read an article, because there is a huge React community in China, but I read an article from a Chinese who actually created Segment Fault saying there is a, or there used to be at least, a big problem of channeling back knowledge from the Chinese React community to the American or to the international because of this language barrier. And you don't have this in Vue. So I think <clears throat> if this continues, we're all just going to use Vue soon because they did do a really great job on this. No, it's just a joke. So, um, <laughs> so Vue is very popular and I think it's getting popular all over the world. But yeah, I just want to say they do a really good job on translation documentation. And that was the last part. What did I talk about? I talked about the uh, shift from not sharing knowledge to actually sharing knowledge, having conferences, having meetups, creating their own platforms to uh, exchange and share knowledge. Also, WeChat is used for that. I talked about the language barrier of both sides. And I said, talked about how to enable developers by providing, and even more people, by providing dedicated translation tasks. Wow. And that's it. Thank you very much. I'm done. Oh. If you, one more thing, if you, if you have, yeah, if you have any feedback, let me know. Hey, thank you.